we start? <laughs> I probably don't need the mic, but <laughs> I will use it anyways. Well, um, my job is to introduce John Smetska. Um, I met John about 10 years ago. He was a student in my class here. I taught chemistry. And what kind of set John apart wasn't his ability to do chemistry, although that was good. <laughs> it was his ability to write. And it was sort of amazing to see some of the responses that he would give um, in the assessments. They were well thought through. And it was just something that uh, a skill that was highly developed, I believe. And so um, as a result of him being in my chemistry class, we um, partnered in an independent study, and, and John develop, helped develop some labs for the department that I don't know if he knows this, but we still use them in some classes. Um, and so it's, it, just having those skills has really helped um, in areas of his life that, and he can contribute in things that you, know, you might not think of um, contributing in. Um, and then after, after John was at uh, GRCC, he transferred out to Grand Valley. Um, he, was, he actually spent a year in France, and then after coming back, he, he, he triple majored in psychology, um, French, and biomedical s sciences. So um, he has quite an extensive background in all those things and a broad interest. And now he's currently enrolled in the physician's assistant program at Grand Valley, and I, I believe he graduates here soon, so. Yep. Yep. So John's going to talk about um, some of the writing that he uses in that program and that he'll use in the medical field. And so, welcome, John. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> <coughs> so the first, first thing I want to talk about, I mean, Bill did a good job of, of introducing me. Um, I'm a grad student at GVSU. I'm in the physician assistant program. Uh, I heard some, I heard you two were asking, like, what is a physician assistant? Uh, oh, um, a, a physician assistant, it's, it's very similar to a nurse practitioner. It's a, it's a mid-level provider. You, you, are, you work, um, you see patients on your own. Um, you either have a hospital that's supervising you or you work under the direct supervision of, a, of, a, of an MD or a DO. Uh, the education. Um, the physician assistant follows the medical model. The nurse practitioner goes through a nursing model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm an alum alumnus of GRCC. I, oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a former bookstore employee as well. Uh, I'm a recreational reader and writer. I write poems. Uh, I write uh, short stories. I've written uh, unpublished novels, um, written plays. Um, and uh, Bill kind of pointed it out uh, in his observations, but I do. I believe I, I owe a great part of my success in medicine to my development as a writer. Um, there are a lot of famous writers that uh, practice medicine. And w when I'm saying medicine, I'm also including nursing as, as the broad medical field. Um, Hippocrates, the founder of medicine, he was a writer um, in, in mythology. Uh, Apollo was the god of, of medicine and poetry. Uh, Athena was the goddess of healing and writing, as well as weaving and war. I put uh, weaving in there because a lot of, a lot of uh, metaphors say you weave a poem or you, you weave a plot. Um, so I, I found that interesting. Uh, the Celtic patroness of poets and healers is Bridget. Also, the gospel writer, St. Luke, he was, uh, he was thought to be a, um, a, a physician. Islamic philosopher uh, Avicenna, uh, Moses Maimonides, who wrote the, the Guide to the Perplexed, is a famous uh, Jewish writer and, and physician. Um, John Keats, the poet, was an apothecary. Uh, Jean-Paul Marat, one of the, the political thinkers of the French Revolution, kind of the, the French equivalent of Thomas Jefferson. He was a physician. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the, the man who gave us Sherlock Holmes, uh, he, was a, he, was, he studied medicine. Um, che Guevara was a, was a doctor. Uh, Anna Freud, the daughter of Sigmund Freud. Um, she was a literary critic as well as being a psychiatrist. And William Carlos Williams, uh, the short story uh, playwright and uh, short story writer, playwright and, and poet, um, was a, a family practitioner. So why are there, in history, why are there so many 
writer physicians? Uh, why are there so many people who, who write and practice medicine? Why do these, why do these fields go together? Um, I think it's because a lot of the skills that you, you develop as a writer and also that, that make you really good at medicine are the same. Um, when you practice medicine, you have to listen. In order to be a good writer, you have to listen. You have to practice empathy. You have to have a sense of, of what, what human nature is about. Um, you have to ask good questions. You have to be curious. Uh, you can't be a very good writer and, be not, and not be curious. You can't be a very good um, practitioner of medicine and not be curious. So, I mean, sometimes curiosity makes all of the difference. Even in medicine, you, you follow, uh, somebody says something like, um, oh, by the way, I have this, this rash behind my neck, and, and it, can lead, it, it can lead your diagnosis in a different way just because you're curious and you start asking questions about it. Um, you record and you describe. I mean, when we, when we talk about the soap notes today, recording and describing are a huge part, um, as well as the S-bar. Um, you observe. Uh, Michel Foucault, the, the French philosopher who, who studied um, the history of medicine and wrote about it, said the clinical gaze is much in common with the artist's eye. And it's true. I, I remember the first time I, I actually saw hypothyroidism. You read about all of these symptoms. You read about the, 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 the skin getting cool. You, you, you read about kind of the slow speech, the slow pace, the fading of the eyebrows from the outside in. And one day, I, even though I read in, in a woman's chart, day after day that she had hypothyroidism, I really got a sense of looking at her. And, and it is, it's very, the clinical gaze, you start to develop that where actually you're diagnosing people while you're talking to them, while you're interacting with them. And it's very, it's very similar to writing. Um, Self-control and self-awareness. People will say the funniest things. People will say bizarre things when you're asking them in an interview, but you have to keep, you have to keep a lot of self-control. You have to, to keep calm. Um, and you have to be very, very aware. Um, because you're a part of important human moments. You're there at the birth. You're there um, when all of the family members are around and people are dying. Um, you're there at sickness. And you have to be aware of human nature. It's not, you're not just treating the patient sometimes. Sometimes you're treating the entire family that's surrounding that patient. Um, and it's similar with writing. I mean, you have to have a lot of self-control, sitting over a a desk and hurting your back all day is, is not pleasant work, but you have to have a sense of the, the end goal. Um, you have to be able to organize information. In nursing, they, you've heard of uh, triage nurses. Triage is French. It, means, it comes from the verb trier, which means to sort. I mean, you have to figure out what's important from what's not important. And the same is true for writing. I mean, what's one of the problems that you're working on when you're developing your skills as a writer? Not having a lot of extraneous details that don't matter, trying to figure out what's important from what's not important. And you have to be able to make precise summaries. Um, you have to be able to condense data to, to relay it. Um, and you have to develop plans, plots or plans, uh, as, our, as our stanzas. Um, so first, what we're going to talk about mostly is the, is the SOAP note. Um, the SOAP note is a is an acronym. It, st it stands for Subjective, Objective, Assessment, and Plan. And that follows a very, um, a very concise form. And in each of those areas, you're doing a very specific thing. But I wanted to put um, next to each other the, the writing skills versus the SOAP note. Because I want you to see, when we talk about the subjective, that like, I want you to think, is this where you're using a lot of listening? Is this where you're asking questions? Um, is this where you're recording and describing? Is this where you're observing? What kind of self-control do I need? Um, am I, how am I organizing information here? And, and also, I mean, there's a whole section in the plan where you're, you're developing plans, where you're being decisive. So just kind of think about these skills that you're developing when you're writing and when you're developing as a writer, because they're going to really help you in your, in your medical career. So the subjective, that's where you gather the chief complaint. Um, you describe it in the patient's own words, so you really have to listen. You have to listen very accurately. You interview the patient and you record the history. The objective section, that's where you perform the physical exam and report findings and observations. The assessment, that's where you determine the problem list and the diagnosis and the plan. 
That's where you develop the treatment plan. And importantly, you educate your patient on your decision. So first, the subjective. What do you ask? You ask what brings them into the, the healthcare setting. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go across here because I wanted to use the, the whiteboard for this. And there's a, there's a really, there are a few good ways of doing this in, in nursing. I think, they, I think they teach you old carts. Have you heard, heard that before? Okay. Well, I like, I like using one called complains because it's really, it, it's not that the patient's complaining, but it just helps me, it helps me remember. And I'll give you an example. So this, the C stands for complaint. So let's say it's chest pain. The O is onset. When did it happen? And let's say it began six hours ago. M is the magnitude. How bad is it? And in medicine, what we typically ask is on a scale of one to 10. One being just no pain at all, and six being you're crying, worst pain you've ever had. And then you ask them to rate it. And let's say that this patient says, oh, it's a six out of 10. The P is for pattern. Does it come and go? Uh, is it always there? Is it there for an hour and then off? It, it, does it happen in the morning? Does it happen in the night? You see this as curiosity. And you ask about the pattern, and let's say they say it's constant. It's always there, and it's sharp. L is for location. Where, where are you feeling this pain? And be very precise. Usually I say, can you, can you point with one finger to where this pain is, particularly if it's constant and if it's sharp. And let's say they say, oh, it's, it's right behind, right behind my, the, the center of my chest. So you can write in their own words, or you can say substernal. And A is for associated symptoms. Do you have any other pain, anything that's going on other than the thing that you're really complaining about? And let's say this patient says, you know, it's really hard. I have this pain, and it's really hard for me to take a deep breath. So you record that. The I is for improvements. Does anything make it better? And let's say, you know, when I'm, when I'm sitting up, it makes it better. And it's for negative stimuli. Does anything make it worse? And let's say, you know, when, I, when I'm leaning forward, it gets better. But when I'm lying flat, that pain just gets worse. And the S is for similar experiences. Has anything like this happened before? And let's say, no, this is the first time. So you put no prior history. And in medicine, HX is often the abbreviation for history. So. Another thing, another, another thing that you want to ask about are worries. When you see the patient, do you have any concerns? Because, I mean, this patient might say, like, am I having a heart attack? Um, what's going on? <laughs> um, you want to get their weight. You want to know if they have fevers. Um, and you want to know how old they are. Because a lot of times, age can determine, uh, can really get you thinking one thing instead of another. It can, it can help you rule out a condition. Um, you want to know if they're sleeping and what their sleep is like. 
Uh, you want to know if they have any allergies. And not just, not just medical allergies. You want to know if they have allergies to the environment. You want to know if they have allergy, allergies to latex. Um, you want to know what medicines they're on. Because if you prescribe them something, it might interact. And, and even, even if you're not the one prescribing, you still want to know these things because you can pick it up. Um, medication errors do happen. Um, and, and they get corrected because people are paying attention and they know what to look for. Um, you want to know their past medical history. What, have they, what, what kind of medical conditions have they had in the past? You want to know about their family because genetics are a huge thing um, in determining disorders. You want to know about when they've been in the hospital and what for. You want to know about their social history. Do they smoke? Do they drink? Um, do they use drugs? Um, are they married? Uh, do they have a lot of, a lot of sexual partners? Um, have they had, even if it's not a lot of sexual partners, have they had recent sexual partners that are new? Um, do they have any children? Um, you you kind of want to get to know your patient, not just in a clinical setting either. You want to ask them their religion in case, you know, something comes in and, and you want to say like, hey, do you want to talk to a pastor? Can I help you out in this? You want to know um, if they've been in the military. So it, the social history not only can, t can tell you Im important information, but it can really help you relate to your patient in a way that it, it help you give them information specifically for them. And of course, you want to know their vaccinations. The second part of the, the subjective, each of these are categories. Um, the second part is, is a category in itself, and that's called the review of systems. And when you think about the body systems, you have your cardiovascular system, you have your pulmonary system, you have uh, the, the systems that, are, that I've noted. You want to ask questions specifically about those systems to see if they're related. So for in, the first system that we would probably cover with this patient that, that I've talked about on the, on the dry erase board is the cardiovascular system. You also want to ask about the pulmonary system. Why is that? You want to ask about the lungs. It's, it's because he has associated er, symptoms of shortness of breath. It's difficult, it's difficult for him to breathe. Um, you'd also want to ask about gastrointestinal systems because um, the, the, rule, the rule usually is um, if you think about the systems from head to toe, if we go from the head, oh, I'm sorry, heed, you see that abbreviation up there? That's, that's fairly standard in, in medicine. Right there. Um, that stands for head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. And that, that kind of covers the, the first system. When you ask questions specifically about a head, their, their head, do you have a headache? Um, any dizziness? You ask questions about the eyes, any blurring? Um, any vision changes, itchiness? You ask about the ears, any hearing loss? Um, discharge from the ears. You ask about the nose, the throat. Then you go into the cardiovascular system, the heart and circulation, the pulmonary system, whether or not they're having difficulty breathing, the gastrointestinal system, sometimes called the GI system. Medicine's full of abbreviations. Um, which is, it's, the GI system, it's not just the gut. It starts with, with the mouth and, and goes down to the bowels. Um, esophagus, stomach, liver, intestines, pancreas, the genitourinary ur system. You want to ask about reproductive health um, and their ability to urinate in the systems that are connected to that, like, like the kidneys, um, and musculoskeletal system, and neurologic and psychiatric. So what, what you typically do is, is, for this patient over here, if we look at the system, he's having, our, our chief concern is with the heart, right? That's not a real heart, but. So what's, we're going to ask about that system, and we're going to also ask what's around it. So we have, the heart, we have the lungs, so we're thinking the pulmonary system. We also have, underneath it, we have the abdomen, so we're going to ask about uh, the GI system. 
because a pain in the stomach, a heartburn sometimes, I mean, it's called heartburn because people think like, oh my gosh, something's wrong with my heart, but it's actually a problem with the stomach. So not only, we're not just gonna focus on the problem that, that seems obvious, but we're also gonna kind of make a broad circle around that as well when we ask about specific, um, specific complaints. So, next section is the objective section. This is where you actually do your physical exam. Oh, I, on that, I, I put, this is a 17th century plague doctor. Um, it was a very dangerous job because they didn't understand what the, what the black plague was. And you'll notice the cane, he didn't touch the patients. And the reason I put that slide on there was because the subjective, do not touch the patients. You don't walk in and you just and start like, oh, I have a rash. You can start looking at the rash, even though your family doctor might do that. Um, using the system, the first thing that you want to do is, is, is step back, observe, and ask questions. The objective section, that's when you start to interact in the physical space of the patient. You come closer. So you do the same thing. You go through the systems. You go through the heat. You go through the, the cardio. You go through the pulmonary, you go through the, through the abdomen. It really helps if you keep the same order in things because then you make sure that you don't forget. And so in, doing, in, going, through, in going through the systems, the first thing that you want to do is you want to look. So the first thing that you touch the patient with is your eyes. You really want to, you want to get in there and you want to say, I'm going to look at you. I'm going to see what's wrong. The second thing typically that you want to do is you want to listen. Now, of course, sometimes it doesn't make sense. If, if you're examining the ear, you're not really going to hear a lot from the ear. But, but you want to look at it. And then the third thing you want to do is to percuss and palpate. You guys, do, does anyone know what percussion is? Yep, exactly. If you, if, if you ever seen a kid do this with their, with their, with their it's, it's similar, like, if, if my mouth is closed, there's a solid structure there. So it doesn't make any, any noise. But if my mouth is open, it's hollow. So we know, that we, we know that it makes a noise. And the same thing, like, if somebody has pneumonia, if it's clogged up, it won't make any noise. It won't be as loud or resonant. So that's percussion. And we can test that on the abdomen. We can test that in, in, in the lungs. And the, next, and the last thing that you do is feel, palpate. So the last thing that you do actually is touch the patient. And you go through the systems. They're there again. The third section is the assessment. This is where you come up with your problem list. And your problem list is going to determine what your diagnosis is. And so, Again, I'm going to go over here and use the, use the whiteboard. I'll keep this for your, for your exercise later. So in your subjective, the patient says to you, I feel tired. So you're going to write down, the patient feels fatigue. They say, you ask them, have, have you had a fever? And they say, yeah, you know, I feel really warm. So you're going to write, the patient's febrile. Do you have a sore throat? Yeah, my sore throat. It's been, it's been really bothering me for the last few days. So you're going to write, the patient has pharyngitis. Now, in your objective section, when you're looking for clinical findings, you're doing the nose exam, and you notice, oh my gosh, their nose is really runny. So you write, rhinorrhea. You notice that they have a high temp from the vital signs. So you've confirmed that they're febrile. You listen to their heart and you notice, oh my goodness, it's going really fast. It seems, it seems faster than normal. So you write tachycardia. These are, these are the medical terms for this. Slow heart rate is called bradycardia. Um, 
And as you progress in your medical career, or, or if you take a medical terminology class, um, th this will help you understand uh, these terminologies. Now, you also want to think about the conditions that they have had chronically for a long time. You also want to think about conditions that they have to manage. Um, management conditions are allergies. I mean, allergies don't really go away. You just kind of push them away and suppress them. Asthma, um, diabetes, smoking. I mean, it's, it's hard to get somebody to quit smoking. You, you, don't, you don't want to force it on them, but you want to bring it up each time and say, like, look, you know, it's bad for you. Would you like some help? Um, surgery sometimes uh, because you know they've had a surgery recently and, and they're still they're still healing from that surgery um, low income it's going to affect what you're prescribing because you don't want to prescribe the most expensive med medicine to somebody if they don't have insurance and they're gonna have to pay for it themselves and also pregnancy I mean that really determines what kind of medicines you can prescribe so you make a note of these things you know they have allergies of asthma they're a smoker, they need to quit because they're pregnant. <laughs> um, so we're gonna work on that one today for sure. Um, they're low income. And let's say their surgery, they just had a carpal tunnel release. So let's say their surgery is their hand surgery. So then, then, then you start thinking about Okay, I have this list of problems that this patient has. What what could that be? And so, do you guys do you guys have any any guesses? Just like things. This is where you kind of brainstorm. It's the creative. It's the creative part with limits. Can, yeah, influenza. Good. Good. Might be a strep throat. Could be allergies. Could be asthma, really acting up. Could be uh, pneumonia. And I need. Yeah, exactly. Anything else? Bronchitis, good. What did you say? Sure could. Could be sinusitis. Sometimes, sometimes when your, your nose is runny, it can go to the back of your throat and make you cough. So this is the point where we're starting to come up with what's called our differential diagnosis. So we've had our problem list. And we're coming up with our differential diagnosis. And now you're gonna, now you're gonna order tests. So let's say we, have a, uh, we do a strep screen, and the strep screen is negative. Um, we go back and, and do a chest x-ray, and we notice there's, no real, there's nothing really in the lungs. So it's not really pneumonia. We have them do a peak flow to see what their asthma is. And let's say it's within normal ranges and it doesn't really seem like it's an asthma attack. But we still want to think about that. We want to make sure that their asthma is controlled, but it's not an attack. Allergies, it, it doesn't really seem like allergies. They usually get their allergies. Um, and, and, you, and sometimes you just ask the patient, does it feel like allergies to you? I mean, it seems like cheating, but you learn a lot just by having the patient, especially with a chronic condition, tell you what they think. Side effects. Um, I think we should keep that on the list. The bronchitis, uh, because of the chest X-ray, even though it's a good suggestion, I uh, let's let's say we're we're going to rule that out. So let's say we're, we're thinking mostly mostly that oops, mostly that it's sinusitis. I'm sorry, I keep running back and forth. I thought I was going to be in a classroom. I didn't realize I was going to be like in a huge in a huge auditorium. So you take the, the, this is where you probably want to number them because you can see it can get kind of, kind of sloppy. Um, you take the number diagnosis and you decide 
on a course of action. This is the plan. But you keep this list of chronic problems. You want to think about their medicines. You're right. You want to think about their allergies. You want to think about their asthma. They had the flu vaccine, because we asked them about vaccines, so we're not thinking it's flu. So our most, our most likely course of action on this is we're going we're gonna to go with sinusitis. So we think it's a, a nasal sinus infection, and you know it's been going on for a while, so we want to we want to we want to give them an antibiotic. But when we ask them about their allergies, it's not just seasonal; they're also allergic to penicillin. So, and they're pregnant. So, we we really want in the plan to start thinking not only about how to treat the problem of sinusitis, but how to treat this whole picture of the patient. How do we treat sinusitis in this, in this woman who is pregnant, has a low income, um, and we're all, we, we, we I, I don't even know, I put smoke around there because I, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to show that it was a chronic condition, but now I feel bad that I put it on there because now I have a woman who smokes. <laughs> Um, so we're going to, yeah, we're solving that right today. <clears throat> it's important to state your decisions clearly uh, so that others can follow your reasoning. What you're creating when you create a SOAP note, think of it very literally as a legal document because that document might end up in court one day. Um, if, if we, for this woman, prescribe her the wrong thing, she, she very well might come back and, and look for, for legal recourse. And what are they going to pull up? They're going to pull up this soap note that you did. So you want to make sure that your medical reasoning is, is able to be followed. Another thing, other than the scary thing of, being, of, of ending up in court, is, is also thinking about somebody coming after you. Like, you know, let's say you're off um, on Thursdays or, or, or Fridays. And there's another doctor or another physician assistant or another nurse practitioner who's taking care of that patient. They're going to have to follow your note to decide, oh, you know, the problem got worse. What did the last person do? So you, you're really helping um, by making it clear. So that's, again, a very, you need that writing skill. Um, and also, there's a different skill. You want to be able to explain things so that the patient understands. Um, if you want patients to take their medicine, if you want them to quit smoking, if you want them uh, to understand what's going on, if you want them not to be anxious, the best thing you can do is to tell them very clearly in a language that they understand what is going on and to explain things and make sure that they're educated. So the, that's the soap note. The next thing is the, the S-bar. Now, the S-bar is not a format. To, to come up with diagnosis. It's not a format to, um, to communicate treatment. What the SBAR is, is a very, very efficient format to record and transfer patient care. So, <laughs> so let's say, what, what's your name? Rebecca. Rebecca. Let's say you are um, a nurse, and let's say you're on duty, and what's, what's your name? Danielle. Danielle? Let's say Danielle is going to take over the shift from you, and I'm the patient. And so what Danielle is want, going to want to know from Rebecca is, what's the situation, what's the background, what's the assessment, and what does she recommend? And so the situation, what you're really going to want to know, uh, what you're really going to want to know from, from Danielle, right? There. No, I'm already confused it. D no, no, Danielle. But you're you're on duty and she's taking over, right? I'm on duty. You're okay. That's what I confused. <laughs> All right. So you're taking over. So Danielle, what you're going to want to know from Rebecca is what's going on with the patient now. Right now, at this moment, who are they? What's their name? Um, the date and the time, when are you taking over? Uh, what's their current diagnosis? This is not, you're not coming up with the diagnosis, but you're reporting the diagnosis. Like for instance, if I have um, 
chronic pneumonia, you're going to want to know that because it's going to affect your, your treatment. You're also going to want to know allergies, isolation. Isolation um, is, like for instance, contact isolation. Some of you know that. But it's, if I have, for instance, MRSA or, or some disease that you really want to isolate the patient because you don't want the other patients coming into contact with that, that's certainly something you're going to want to communicate. Uh, also, destination. Like, for instance, am I even here? Am I supposed to be at, at radiology to get an x-ray in the next 20 minutes? Um, the next section, background. What was going on with this patient? So. The code status, you know, if something terrible happens, do we resuscitate them? Uh, and this is the reason that this is something that was going on is because it's a, it's, a, it's a patient decision that was made often before something happened. Um, people sit down usually and think about these things and then say, this is my decision, if, uh, particularly if they're chronically ill. Um, so that's something you communicate in the background. Their past medical history that's relevant. Um, whether what their mental status is, like for instance, if I'm if I have dementia and I'm uh, I'm saying strange things all the time, and that's my normal baseline. Um, you're going to want to communicate that. However, if suddenly on Danielle's shift, um, I who I'm talking like I am now start just going crazy and being violent. You're going to wonder, really, if there was a change in my medical condition. So that needs to be communicated. Um, mobility, whether or not I can walk, or whether or not I'm a fall risk, um, both, both because of uh, um, musculoskeletal problems, but also, for instance, people with strokes, they're fall risks because they lose their balance. Um, vision and hearing. For, so can can Danielle when when she when she talks to me if I'm if I'm blind can she say do you do you take this menu item or do you take this menu item and if I can't see I won't know or if I can't hear I won't be able to to answer her so these are things that you're going to want to communicate in in the background the assessment she, Danielle's really going to want to know how do I manage this patient now um, what, do they need oxygen how many times do I need to take their vital signs. Um, what are their ins and outs? Ins and outs are uh, what they're eating and, and what they're expelling. So you keep track of fluids, uh, fluid levels that way. Um, their pain scale. So if there's someone who's like chronically in pain and they're always like at a 6 out of 10, if Danielle's taking over and she talks to this patient and says, what's your pain scale? And they say, oh, it's a 6. If she didn't know that, she'd say, oh, my goodness, this patient suddenly is in pain. Um, you're going to want to know uh, special labs, special considerations, I mean, and what do you recommend? Uh, what should be done for the care of this patient? Um, are you going to transfer them? Are they going back to a nursing facility? Um, are, when they're, <coughs> excuse me, when they're, when they're, do they need prescription refills? Are there any findings that you've th that you've discovered? For instance, their pain scale used to be two, and now it's a six. Um, Do they need counseling? I mean, earlier we talked about asking their religion. I and mean, some people, they really, they really feel like, oh, I want to I wanna see a pastor today, or I want to see a priest. <clears throat> and, and counseling can also mean uh, psychiatric counseling. Some people, some people want to um, talk to a therapist. The next section is. Uh, the structure of, of writing in journals and the structure of, of writing graduate thesis. Now, I'm a graduate student, so um, I, I recently had to write a graduate thesis. But the reason I'm, I'm putting this in there is because in order, an, another aspect of writing medically is, is you, you always want to read, and you always want to read writings. You want to you you constantly improve. And that's one of the exciting things about it. Um, it it's, if you're a person who likes to constantly improve, both writing and medicine are for you. Um, the good news of, of, of thesis writing uh, in medicine and, and journal writing in medicine is, is that they're often structured in the same way. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the main sections uh, of a thesis. That's going to be the main, main sections of a journal. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about my thesis, um, not because I want you to get so much of uh, my thesis out of this. It's not really probably going to 
help you that much, but it's just an example, it's an illustration. So the main sections are the introduction, the review of literature, the methodology and method section, and the discussion and conclusion. After these sections, that's where you find the references, the big list of everyone who cited the appendices, um, and the charts. So the introduction. The introduction is broken down into four parts. The background of the problem, the problem statement, the purpose, the significance of the problem, and the hypothesis. Now, my graduate thesis, I, I had kind of an unusual uh, background of the problem. I started um, historically a long time ago. But I talked about genomics, which is, uh, which is gene mapping. And I talked about uh, mapping culture. Um, and I, I unveiled some subtle conflicts with scientific method. Um, as particularly when we, when we look at the scientific method as a kind of map making. Um, the problem statement and the question, uh, given limited materials and resources, could a primer be designed to bring about necessary site-directed mutagenesis? Site-directed mutagenesis, that's where on a gene you, um, you mutate one amino acid and to, to see if it, it can create um, a change in the structure. Um, the purpose and aims, I discussed the goals of the research with appreciation to the results addressed in number one. Four, I discussed the, uh, the significance of the problem. I discussed the application of the results and the importance of the scientific practice for the clinician. And uh, five, my hypothesis, it was very much like the problem statement except that I narrowed it down and chose a specific protein. Um, the review of literature, this is where you take all of the literature that you can find on a topic and you summarize it. So in my graduate thesis, I, I talked about what is site-directed immunogenesis, what is E. coli, that's the bacteria used to replicate the changes. Um, and my review of literature focused on the specific protein that I use and various research regarding the mapping and applications of this particular gene. The methodology, this is where you really focus on your study design. Now, with, with, for instance, a lot of medical research, the study design is going to be really important because when you look at it in the journal, is, is it a true experiment? Is it one group took a placebo and the other group took the drug? And these are the results of, of the two when compared to each other. Mine, I, I did, uh, the research that I did didn't really have like a pure study design. I had, so I just wrote about the sequence of events that I used in my investigation. Um, is study site and subjects. This is where you talk about the populations that you used or um, who, who the, the subjects of your study were. Um, but even, even with, with a graduate thesis like mine, I used bacteria, so I talked about the bacteria even though that wasn't necessarily what you would consider a human subject. Um, well, in no way you would consider that a human subject. Three, the equipment and instruments. I talked about some of the, the equipment and the instruments that I used, the procedure. I talked about the laboratory work and how it went, and the data analysis. I talked about the analysis of my results. And the discussion and conclusion section. Here in your journals and also in the thesis, you discuss the work, the problems that you had, why you think, what you think you could have improved, and that's a very important part, um, and, and what you think was successful. And, I put here because it's important to remember that ideally even research that fails can contribute um, because it prevents people from doing the same thing. Uh, or, or, or it tells them like, oh, you know, this person used this machine or, or this technique and if I used a different machine or a different technique then maybe I could, I could achieve successful results. In this section also, future research is proposed. So this is the writing activity. Um, now you have to forgive me because I thought I'd have like a big, a, a large, a large group, but I have four people, so. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, but I also thought I ha would have a classroom, and here I am in this like huge, enormous. I thought I'd have a full classroom, and I have an empty auditorium. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted you guys to to try your hand at a soap note, so. Um, here is, what I was going to have you do is I was going to have you break off into pairs, um, but I was going to have you work with strangers because in healthcare you're always working 
with people you don't know. And, and like, for instance, you can tell these two know each other. But if you were to ask each other questions and practice that way, it's not going to be the same as practicing with a stranger. Oh, you all know each other? I don't, I've never seen her before, but we, we all know each other. All right, well, you're going you're gonna to pair up with her. With, with her. Mm -hmm. No, you're, you two are going to pair together. Okay. And you two are going to pair together. And here's your subjective template. And so you can ask each other questions and check them off. <clears throat> and when it's time for the physical exam portion, here's your objective template. You're welcome. Oh, uh, of the objective? You have a subjective, oh, okay. but here's here's an example of the kind of writing. Now I haven't looked at this in a long time. This I like I grabbed this from last year in school. So you need an objective. I dropped one on the floor. <clears throat> no, you, these are yours to keep. So when you want when you write your soap note because you're supposed to have a writing exercise, you can kind of like if you run into problems, you can say like oh you know what what's done there. You can kind of look at it. But so start out with this objective. And I, I wrote here, this is only a writing exercise. So you're not required to give honest personal information. So, you know, you don't, if you feel ashamed about, uh, 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 or you feel like, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to keep my privacy regarding this, and somebody, and, and you, because it's a stranger, <laughs> don't, don't give, you don't have to give an answer. You can make up something. Um, the, the rule that I thought is you don't have to give real answers, but try to give realistic ones. Um, and, and remember that when you're interviewing, because you want to practice being non-judgmental and empathetic, that this person, you're, they're giving a realistic answer, so don't judge them. Just think like, oh, they could be lying about anything. On the ob objective portion, um, these are actually, like I tried, I tried to, keep them, to keep them very modest. I tried to like, say like, oh, you know, check their, the range of motion, check whether or not they're, check their pulses. So you can, get, you can actually get some, some information on the objective section by, by doing a mini physical exam on your partner. Um, it's important to note though, you're allowed, if you have an injury, particularly if you have an injury, don't do it. You don't have to explain why. Just say it to your partner, like, I'd prefer not to do this. And as, as the, as the partner, be a good partner and say like, okay, well, let's move on to the next thing. And you can just put patient declined this on your notes. And remember that these are not actual medi medical diagnoses. This is just kind of giving you a sense of like, from the other end of being a clinician going in there, like what's it like to actually do a physical exam on somebody or what's it like um, doing a subjective? So that's it. So let's, if you, wanna, if you wanna get started, you can get started. If you have questions, you can ask me.